thank you for your patience, everyone. I think we're ready to start. So first thing is, I'd like you to pretend that it's early in the morning and you took your garden trug out to the garden and this was brought was ready for you to pick. You found a golden egg squash. You found a couple of gypsy peppers. You found some green beans and a few cherry tomatoes and that great big squash down there at the bottom of the trug, uh, which is a Italian squash that's grown on a trellis about six to eight feet. And one minute you have none and the next day you go out and there's about 15 of them that size hanging from your trellis. And so you tell yourself that, wow, this is a great opportunity to have a family reunion with a hundred people. So anyway, you're looking at your garden truck and you're deciding that, well, what am I gonna do with this today? Well, I could make, um, I could make a frittata with the peppers. I could make a quiche with some of the squash. I can have berries on my ice cream. You've just got the idea of what having a kitchen garden is all about. Today, we're gonna to talk about the growing conditions that are most desirable for a kitchen garden, what you should be considering if you want to grow a successful kitchen garden, and how to start your garden. First thing we're gonna talk about really is the difference between a harvest garden and a kitchen garden. A harvest garden is where you plant everything pretty much at the same time, May or June. You get out and you get everything planted in your long rows. And then long about September, everything's ready to be harvested and you are dealing with in many cases, 15 cabbages, 100 pounds of tomatoes, and you have everything all at once come ready to be harvested. A kitchen garden, on the other hand, is all kind of mixed up. You have flowers mixed in with herbs, mixed in with vegetables, mixed in with fruit. For instance, on the right-hand side of your screen, You'll see some cabbages, some lettuce, some poppies, some, I believe that's beans in the top left corner. There's chives, there's nasturtiums. Everything is kind of planted together. Why that happens is because whenever you have a space, you, you're putting something new in. The characteristics of a kitchen garden, it's kind of like a merry-go-round. You jump on and you get started. And then if you decide to take a season off, you jump off. It's not a June to September thing. Seasonal cooking is very important. Your whatever is in your garden, that's what you're eating. It can vary, it's definitely gonna vary by your elevation. Some of you may start earlier and be able to grow different things. Um, if you're down in Ione, you may not be growing um, too many uh, alpine strawberries because of the heat, but if you're up in the uh, 3,500 foot elevation, you might be able to be growing plenty of alpine strawberries. Your kitchen garden is going to be planted intensively. It's going to have something in every space, but it's not fussy. And by fussy, I mean, you didn't line up all your little marigolds in a row around your beds. You stuck them in wherever you had a space just because you wanted to fill that space. You wanted to discourage or you wanted to encourage pollinators and for a variety of other reasons like you'd like it to look pretty. You're going to be making mistakes and I could share many of my mistakes over the years with this. Uh, I encourage everybody to keep a garden journal in order to tell what you've, uh, what's worked and what hasn't, what you like to eat, what you didn't like to eat. Here's an example of one of my winter boxes with kale and cabbages and some dianthus planted in the corner. Around the edge there, you can see that there's part of a boxwood hedge, which I'll talk about a little later. Here's my definition of a kitchen garden. 
It supplies fresh vegetables, fruits, herbs, and flowers to your family on a daily basis throughout the year. Sometimes you may go out there and all you have is a few herbs that you can add to something, maybe a few flowers. Why would you wanna grow a kitchen garden? Well, you can adjust it to your needs and your tastes. If you decide that you love having green beans in your garden in the summer, you might decide to add bush beans and put in a trellis to have pole beans. You can start out small, like four, I started out with four five by five raised beds and continued to add to that as I needed more space. A kitchen garden promotes biodiversity. By that, I simply mean that everything is kind of mixed up in the garden and your insects don't have one giant spot to go for their favorite lunch or dinner. You've got uh, your marigolds mixed in with your tomatoes. You've got your peppers mixed in your, with your basil. Everything's kind of a little mishmash where the insects, you're, you're fooling the insects into where they're going. A kitchen garden supplies food at the peak of freshness. And I'm gonna tell you my favorite little story from one of my favorite authors about a kitchen garden. George Ann Brennan is somebody who lives in our area. She lives over in Woodland. She's written a number of books on kitchen gardens and she made regular trips to France and she talks about going to a farmer's market and telling the grower who had a whole bunch of melons for sale that she wanted to have a melon that would be perfect for dinner that night. So the grower picks out the melon and sells it to her. And she has to, the, the grower has to make sure that it's the perfect uh, at peak of freshness. Otherwise, George Ann might come back and tell her that it wasn't as good as it should have been. A kitchen garden is going to supply you safe and healthy food. We've all heard the stories about the listeria in the melons and the salmonella and the romaine. So when you're growing your own kitchen garden, you're going to know what pesticides you used or hopefully you didn't use and what exactly went into that garden. For a kitchen garden, your growing conditions. Obviously the most important one is that you need full sun. Six to eight hours is ideal. You wanna be sure you have available water. And I can guarantee you that carrying sprinkling cans with two gallons of water at a time is not the way to go. A sprinkling can, a two gallon sprinkling can with water in it weighs about 16 pounds. And in the winter time, when I, we have the water turned off in the, in the garden, that's what I end up doing if we don't have rain for a while. So um, make sure that you have it available close. You want your kitchen garden to be close to your house but if you have to pick between full sun and proximity to the house, choose the full sun. It's, it's kind of ideal if you could actually see it from your back door. The soil. You want the soil to have a pH of about six and a half. And when, when you have it below six, the soil will use up phosphorus, potassium, and calcium so that it won't be available to your plants. If your, uh, your pH is above six and a half, your soil is it's gonna use up the, the iron and the zinc. So it's best to, to have it in the range of six and a half. Raised beds is ideal. The ones that I've got in, the, in our yard is, are probably 20 years old and they have not had to be replaced yet. Then you're kind of guaranteed about having uh, your soil being well-drained. We, we here are in uh, climate zone, sunset climate zone seven, which means our frost dates are May 1st and November 1st. So the last date in the spring that we could possibly have frost would be May 1st. And the first chance of frost in the fall would be November 1st. This, this date is especially important for planting your summer vegetables. 
The California Interactive Heat Zone map is kind of interesting. We are zone eight, which means that Jackson, Sutter Creek, and Pine Grove will have 91 to 120 days of temperatures above 86. That is important for the types of things you might be putting in. I mentioned before alpine strawberries. If you're going to be growing them, they like it much cooler and you will have to, you'd have to grow them in the shade here in order to have them go through the summer. Same thing for any kind of salad greens that uh, it, they don't like it that much above 86 degrees. Okay, there's going to be a lot of questions for you to consider when you're thinking about a kitchen garden. First of all, is it worth the space in the garden? It is that vegetable or fruit that you're thinking about planting. If you can go to the store and buy a bunch of radishes for 50 cents, do you really want to, spend, to take up the space in your garden with radishes? Now there's nothing wrong with radishes and they grow quickly. And if you're planning a cocktail party where you're planning to serve radish hors d'oeuvres with butter and sea salt sprinkled on them, maybe it would be worth growing radishes. Another thing is onions. Onions are wonderful and every few years I take up an entire bed with onions, but they take six months and that's a long time to have a bed taken up by something. Potatoes is another thing. Since you have to fill in dirt on top of the potatoes as they grow, that's is that really conducive to a raised bed? Are you going to take up an entire raised bed with potatoes? Next consideration, how many ways can I use it? Okay, so if you decide to grow cucumbers, well, okay, you can use them in salads and actually the English make cucumber sandwiches, which are actually kind of interesting. You can make refrigerator pickles. So you may decide that cucumbers are probably worth growing. What about cabbages? Are they worth growing? Well, maybe because they taste way differently than anything you would buy in the grocery store. But also you could make sauerkraut with them. You could make add them to soups and stews. You could make coleslaw, but keep in mind that you'll be eating that coleslaw in the winter time. Do you have space for perennial herbs, vegetables, and fruits? Once you plant these, they're there. So you have to decide if you wanna take up your space with something that's going to have to stay permanently in place. This is especially important if you're thinking about putting in asparagus or artichokes. Uh, I personally think it's worth it to have a bed of strawberries. So I take up an entire five by five box with ever bearing strawberries. Perennial her herbs, you cut them back once a year and let them grow back. So they're in that one place for as long as you like. I have my perennial herbs off in where they're not with my main beds. On the right is oregano, rosemary, thyme, sorrel, and lemon balm. And on the left, there's fennel and sage and winter savory and tarragon and chives. All of those are perennials. They're all off where they don't disturb the rest of the garden. Are you going to have fruits that need one, a place like blueberries? I, I have uh, 10 barrels of blueberries all planted, but they are in permanently in oak barrels and off to the side. And I will talk a little bit about enclosing your garden and then we'll talk about the blueberries again. Also, are you going to have any citrus? I am at 1700 feet in the foothills. And so citrus is a chance for me, but we still have it and they're separately part of my kitchen garden. Are you going to use compost to add nutrients and fertilizer to your garden? Or are you going to be purchasing it? It's of course, the thing, the best part about compost is it's free. And 
So if you decide to use your own compost, that obviously is going to be much better. The best part about using your own is that you know what's in it. It came from your own house and garden, and it doesn't have any herbicides or pesticides in it. Next thing you need to consider is how are you going to handle pests? And they will come. There's earwigs and there's cabbage worms and there's aphids and there's hornworms and there's spider mites and there's snails and there's birds. All these pests have non-chemical means that they can be handled. For instance, if you have a, an invasion of earwigs, you can set out a tuna can with a little bit of salad oil on the bottom next to the plant that is being affected. So these are things you need to consider when you have a kitchen garden. Another thing is, are you going to be direct seeding? Are you gonna be starting your own transplants or are you going to be buying transplants? Direct seeding, and we will have a chart a little bit later that will, will show you a little bit more on that. You, you have to be a good planner in order to direct seed, or I'm sorry, that should be in order to start your own transplants. And there's nothing wrong with buying your own transplants. These are all pixie cabbages that I started. Uh, in order to get them to this side, I needed a six week head start. So if I know they're gonna, when they're gonna be going out in the garden, I have to get them started someplace or six weeks in advance. Do you have the time to make daily visits to the garden? I can't emphasize this enough. You need to go out every day to check on, on your garden. Some things will be ripe and ready to harvest. Sometimes you'll notice that something's been chewing on your plants and you, may, you might, may find a sprinkler line that isn't working properly and something is wilting, or you may go out and find everything wilted in the morning, which tells you that it's, you need to adjust your sprinklers for that particular time. How are you gonna fill the empty space after you harvest something? With kitchen garden, you don't want empty spaces that don't have anything in them. When you finish harvesting your squash, that's gonna be a mighty big space to fill. Be thinking about what you're gonna put in there so that as soon as it's harvested, you add compost to the area and you put something in again. If you grow vertically, vertically on a trellis, you're gonna increase your growing space by a lot. This is one of my favorite ways to fill in spaces. This is cut and come again lettuce. There's all different kinds of it. Uh, you may recognize the seed packages, but I covered up the name. If you see the word mescaline on a seed package, that means that it's a mixture that has greens and of arugula and romaine and spinach and maybe some sorrel. The nice thing about cut and come again sal uh, mescaline mixes is you can cut a little bit and leave about two inches on it. And then in six to eight weeks, it will come back and you'll get a second cutting of it. So this is a great way to fill in, especially a big space. If you took out a squash, you'll, you um, said throw in some compost, mix it up, lay some seeds down, cover it with some row cover and in a, a few weeks, you're gonna have your first crop of cut and come again lettuce. I have a, bar a couple barrels towards the front of the garden with uh, some chrysanthemums in them. And when the chrysanthemums are cut back, there's a lot of empty space. A great space to put in some more lettuce. But as you can see on the right, that's how big the chrysanthemum gets. So I'm only taking advantage of the, the empty space that I have during some of the year when I, when I can go ahead and plant that lettuce. And then a little bit later, the size of the chrysanthemum has increased substantially. Here's another example of filling in spaces. The very back of the garden are the, are the end of the tomatoes in the front 
of that is some basil, but I harvested pole beans off the trellis and now it's time to put in some snow peas. You're always thinking about what you're gonna put in. You've got the end of your summer vegetables and the beginning of your fall and winter vegetables. Here's some evergreen strawberries. And one of my favorites for this area is seascape. It, they're planted in rows in the raised bed, but there's no reason you can't take advantage of the space in between the rows. There's a whole row of carrots in there. Do you have sufficient water nearby and are you going to use drip irrigation? I have um, drip lines on all my boxes. I can shut off the water to, um, to each box individually if I want to. I've just turned off the water to the bed that has all the onions in it so I can begin to harvest them. Drip irrigation pays off. It's, it's a lot of work up front, but it pays off in the long run. It keeps the bed it doesn't make any difference where I plant something in that bed. It's all going to get watered. Are you only going to grow heirlooms or are you going to include some hybrids? Sometimes we get all wrapped up in heirlooms and forget that maybe it's a good idea to put in a few hybrids that are safer and less prone to um, diseases. So while it's Find to put in lots of interesting ones. Try to put in a few staples also. A, an heirloom means simply that it's open pollinated and it's at least 50 years old. It's been grown for at least 50 years old. You get novelty, you get taste, you have historical connections. But when you put in hybrids, you get more vigorous growth and more adaptable. Do you really, really want a harvest garden? If you're determined to plant 20 tomatoes and 15 peppers, you probably really don't want a kitchen garden. Does somebody in the family like to cook? Again, this may seem obvious, but if nobody's interested in cooking what's there, you may decide that this isn't for you because pretty much you go out there and what you have in the garden determines what you're having for dinner that night. And obviously I don't have a, I don't have bacon growing in my garden and I don't have um, uh, ground beef growing in the garden, but everything that's gonna go with my dinner is gonna be growing in the garden. You also need to consider how you're gonna rotate your crops. The, the best thing to do is to simply draw draw your boxes every time you change seasons to show what's in there. You, you have to know your plant families and be familiar with uh, what you can, what you shouldn't be planting right after something else. Uh, this is a copy of the vegetable families. If you look down there at the, uh, let's say the very bottom, the nightshade family has potato, the potatoes or tomatoes in it. It also has eggplant and peppers. So you wouldn't wanna take out a, a pepper and put in something in, from the same family in that same spot. Uh, same thing for the brassica family with the, uh, which includes arugulas, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, all kinds of things. So this, this chart will help you not plant something in the same place year after year. And this is also will be available in the, uh, our, the crack techno technological team there is going to make sure this is available to you. Okay, some planning basics. Obviously you wanna be realistic. How much can you really take care of? A kitchen garden requires some work almost every day, but more intense work when you're, when you're changing seasons. I think it's a good idea to enclose your space as best you can. It doesn't have to be enclosed on all spaces, but on all sides. But if you enclose it, then you know where you're going every day. You've got a spot. You walk out that back door 
and there's your kitchen garden. It's in one space, you head for it. Here's some options that you can enclose your garden with. You could have short spaces. You could use perennial vegetables. You could have your asparagus or your artichokes lining one edge of the, of the garden. You could have a line of barrels with blueberries in them, or you could espalier fruit trees or put some citrus in pots. You could use your perennial herbs to enclose your space, or you could grow, you, you could have roses or sunflowers or even hollyhocks there. You want to include paths. And I want you to imagine your kitchen garden in December or in January and it's raining and you're taking your umbrella and you're going out there to the garden to see what's ready to be harvested. It's wet out there and you don't want you to get all muddy. So by putting in paths, it makes it a lot more tempting to be able to, to go out there and, and uh, harvest some things even in inclement weather. We have a large oak tree in the backyard and every year it drops all of its leaves. We grind up those leaves and put them in between all the beds. So when I go out in the winter, I'm, I'm not getting my shoes all muddy. You wanna grow vertically, vertically to save space. There's lots of things that can be planted on a trellis. If you've got an old gate, that's a wonderful trellis. You can use most anything for a trellis. Um, here's, here's some squash being grown on a trellis, but also cucumbers, peas, pole beans, all of these can be grown vertically to save space in your bed. On the left, of your screen is a, is a trellis and it's got, um, I believe it's got uh, some kind of peas on it and beneath it, shading it, there's carrots and radishes there. And so the peas are providing a little shade for the carrots and the radishes. I think that's a great idea. I don't know where the picture, uh, the picture's got the little rocks sitting on the edge of the bed there. And I think to myself, I, I always have rocks setting outside my beds in the corners so that when I have to run out there and put row cover over something, I have a way to secure it and hold it down to keep it from blowing away. Here's an example of something grown vertically, way too many tomatoes and look at the size of the trellises. So keep that in mind when you're putting in a kitchen garden that some things take up a lot of space and even these growing vertically is still a lot of space. If you have some odd things, like if you're determined to grow potatoes, I'd suggest using a grow bag. You can add, you can, um, add a sprinkler to the grow bag and grow your carrots there like, um, not, not carrots, I'm sorry, potatoes there. Because then you can cover, cover the potatoes up as they grow and you, you aren't dealing with an entire bed. It's also good if you've got something that requires a different kind of soil, like your blueberries, which, re, which need um, acid soil. If you're growing in a grow bag or in a barrel someplace, then you have a way to control the acidity. You can start off just by purchasing acidic potting mix and then check your pH level once or twice a year to make sure it's in the correct range. But I can, I can say that you don't want to acidify an entire bed because uh, speaking from experience, it takes an awful long time to get it back to a, a normal pH. You might want to consider multi-grafted fruit trees. Uh, this can't really be a fruit tree because of what's on it. But you can get, a, get fruit trees where uh, the pollinizers are grafted right onto the, the tree. And then you don't have to have um, two trees. You could have one instead. Putting in flowers is always a great idea to attract pollinators. There are, actually you can barely see it, but there are peppers in this bed 
along with some marigolds and some teddy bear sunflowers. Okay, let's get started. I bet you weren't expecting to see a whole page of little boxes. We're gonna start with May. This is May. Here's what you can do in your garden. If you wanna start your kitchen garden right now, you can direct seed anything from pole beans to cucumbers, to melons, to okra, which start putting in your winter squash. The key down at the bottom of the page, the DS stands for direct seed, the ST is start transplants, and the T is for transplanting. You'll notice that if you are planting tomatoes in your bed, you should have started them in February. Fortunately, you can probably still find them locally to put into your garden. If you wanted to grow peppers, they should have been started in January or February in order to transplant them to your garden in May. This chart is very handy and I use it constantly. I'm at elevation, as I said before, elevation 1700. This is a mid elevation chart from 1,000 to 2,500 feet. In the lower elevations, you can start two weeks earlier in the spring and go um, two weeks later in the fall. And in the higher elevations, you're going to go earlier in the fall and about two weeks later in the spring. Here's some, there's some elevations locally at the bottom of this page. And here's also some um, herbs which can be started in May like basil or dill. These are cool weather vegetables. And as you, as you can see here, there's also some direct seeding that can be done, still be done in May if you want to put in uh, carrots or beets. The next four slides are um, approximate harvest schedule. It's going to depend on your elevation. And the reason I include this is because that way you have an idea of what is available for your meals in different parts of, uh, in different times of the year. For instance, in the spring, April through June, you could have available carrots or arugula or broccoli or beets or leeks. You're gonna, you, you may have apricots and blueberries. Herbs that will be ready are your winter savory and your lemon balm and rosemary and any of your perennial herbs. And you could have uh, dianthus and roses in your garden. Summer, this is when we've got the cucumbers and the beans, and the tomatoes and the summer squash. And you have melons and maybe some early pomegranates and plums and basil. And of course your marigolds and sunflowers. In the autumn, you start to get your broccoli you're gonna have your winter squash that you harvested and stored. You're going to have, um, you're gonna have some of your, some of the pomegranates, mine come in about end of October to uh, beginning of November. You are gonna have apples and some of your limes perhaps. And you might be planting snapdragons and asters. And in the winter, you'll have your radishes, if you're growing them, spinach, kale, there's your stored winter squash. You'll have oranges and lemons and parsley, calendulas. Here are some of my favorite references for this kitchen, for kitchen gardens. As I said, we're lucky to have two rather famous authors that live within about 125 miles of Amador County. George Ann Brennan, who has written a lot of books on kitchen gardens, and Rosalind Creasy, who lives somewhere in the Bay Area, who's written a lot of books on edible gardens. And then of course, the Sunset Western Garden Book of Edibles. Okay, we're back to another harvest in the winter time. You've got a cabbage, you've got some snow peas, You've got some regular peas and you've got some broccoli. What are you gonna make for dinner tonight?
And that's all I have. Does anyone have, I guess I'm gonna have my crack team handle the questions if there are any. And I thank you for your attention. Okay, thanks Noreen, this is Maureen. And we have just a few questions. Actually, Tracy uh, answered a few of them in the chat box. Um, but the one I think that's pretty pertinent to a lot of people listening here is we have a beginner, beginning gardener, and she's kind of wondering like, how do you start a container kitchen garden? I know you went over a lot of the details, but what would be the first, what would be your recommendation for the first thing that you would do? Well, it's going to depend on your budget and whether you have access to um, purchasing raised beds or, or whatever. So that, that is a factor. But if, you, if you're on a limited budget and, um, and you want to get started, I think the first, I think I would go out and... Um, uh, I would start with a, a large grow bag or a couple of large grow bags. And I would come up, I would get some potting soil. I would put them relatively close to the house in full sun. And I would purchase the transplants because that's going to be easier than, than um, trying to um, direct seed your garden or, or to grow the transplants. So I've seen grow bags that come uh, 30 to 36 inches in diameter, which is a, a, a pretty good size. I would start small. If you can afford oak barrels, they last for quite a while before they, they rot, especially if you can keep them off the ground, um, out of direct contact with the ground. So that's how I would start. I was, I was lucky enough to have my husband build the the raised beds, the four or five by five raised beds to get me started. And then we um, wheelbarrowed in um, potting soil in bulk to get started. Thanks, Noreen. In fact, I'm gonna throw in a quick question for you on that. So I've heard you refer to this. Just how large a container do you need to grow herbs appropriately? What, what would be the smallest size container that you would recommend? I would, yeah, I would say, I'm, I'm looking on my, on my quilt cutting board here to decide here, probably 15 or 16 inches, depending on what it is. Is that in so diameter? In diameter, yes, okay. in diameter, yeah. Because something like parsley, you you cannot imagine how big parsley can get. Um, you might be able to put three basil plants in a container that size. Uh, rosemary needs at least that that much space. Uh, tarragon, you could probably get three tarragon pl plants in a container that size. It's all going to depend on what you want to put in there. Thanks, Noreen. We had a question on an easy, best way to check pH. Now, Tracy actually put some information into the chat box for you. But do you have any comments on um, how you check the pH? Because you mentioned that for your blueberries. Um, you can buy a test kit at most nurseries to check. It's a little involved, so... <laughs> But it's pretty. It's everything that you need is there, and they're not very expensive. I think they're under ten dollars. Okay, that pretty much matches what Tracy put in the chat box. Thanks. Um, let's see. We don't really have any other questions like that. Oh, the name. Would you go over the name of that author one more time? The woman that lives in Woodland. She was the first one that you mentioned. I know she's on your resources, but. What was her name again? George Ann Brennan is the one that lives in Woodland. Um, she has written, I said, as I said before, a number of books on particular, particularly Potagers, the French kitchen garden, and uh, um, anything that she's written would be is helpful. And the the best part about both of these authors is that there's recipes 
for ever, for the for things in the book. So if you if you're kind of at a loss as to what to do with everything, there's uh, each one of those ladies always includes, you know, a a, a portion of their book with the with uh, recipes. Ro Rosalind Creasy is the one that lives towards the Bay Area. Oh, those sound like great resources. They are. Noreen, that's all the questions we have at this time for you. If any more come into our uh, website, we'll contact you on them if they're kitchen garden questions. But we want to thank you very much. And I'm going to turn it over to Doris or to Ed. I'm not sure who's coming up next. Oh, I thank think we should go ahead, Ed. OK. Thank you so much for attending our presentation about kitchen gardening today. Remember this presentation will be posted on our website early next week if you should want to review it. Happy gardening.